Chad Eastie Show News Talk KFYO. Thank you for tuning in today. Time to go to the phones and uh, we visit with Republican strategist, a uh, great friend of the program, Matt McCoviak. Matt, good morning. How are you today? Doing pretty good, Chad. How about you? Doing all right. Uh, last night was uh, night number one of the Republican convention. Uh, to me, Matt, it, it really did uh, exceed all my expectations. I, I thought it was very well put together. I thought the speakers were great. Uh, what, what did you think uh, about last night's uh, convention? Yeah, same here. Uh, really, no false notes, uh, no mistakes, no no you know problems created or controversies. There were just so many compelling moments. It's hard to even say kind of what your favorite was. Um, you know, Maximo Alvarez talking about growing up in a socialist country and, and what that meant for his family. Uh, escaping Cuba, I thought was powerful. Um, Senator Tim Scott, Republican of South Carolina, the only African American Republican in the Senate, uh, just offered a message that is uh, very uplifting, um, and I think uh, would have support, you know, across lots of different demographics in our in our country. You know, there's just so many really great moments. Nikki Haley, I thought was great. Uh, you know, a number of others. So yeah, it was. Not only was the sort of stage production aspect of it, uh, you know, noticeably better, I think, than the Democrats. But the message itself was strong, too. It was not as negative uh, as the Democratic uh, Convention was. Certainly there's a contrast, and, and when you offer a contrast, you're going to be you know, using negative terms to describe your opponent. Um, but I thought it was just a, a really, really good night, a really good opening. I, my, my sense is if you watched the first night of the Democratic National Convention, you probably felt like you didn't need to watch the rest of it. I think if you watched the Republican, first night of the Republican National Convention, you probably decided, um, I'd like to watch a little more of that. And so I imagine the uh, the TV audience is going to be pretty strong. Yeah, no, it's you know you know the uh, the production was great. I mean, just and like I said, all the all the speeches were just absolutely fantastic. How many people do you think? You know, obviously a lot of Republicans were watching last night. Yeah. Is there anyone undecided? I, I mean, I, I know that's who you know both are trying to reach those undecideds out there. Yeah. Uh, but but it just seems like everyone is so polarized that I mean either you love Trump or you hate him or you you kind of know who you're going to vote for by now right or we or is is there that special group that is floating out there that's going to be watching and maybe decide during these conventions? Well, it's certainly the the case that we're seeing a smaller number of undecided voters than we normally see in, in an election. Um, and that is for the reason you identify, which is that Trump is polarizing. Uh, people have very strong views about him. Um, but what we, what we also know, though, is that Trump's job approval uh, moves around. And so, you know, if he is in, you know, if he's in the mid-40s or even low-40s, uh, he has an outside chance to win. Uh, if he's in the mid-30s or low, you know, low-30s somehow, um, that, that's almost impossible because his re-elect number and his job approval are basically tracking within two points of each other. Um, what we've seen is that, you know, a month ago or six weeks ago, he was probably more in the, you know, mid-30s, low-30s, uh, you know, area in terms of job approval. That's ticked up. I saw uh, late last week he was in the low-40s. Um, and so that's why the race has tightened, particularly in the battleground states. So I guess to that point, Chad, it, it, you know, the convention offers an opportunity for Republicans to make the case that the president has done a good job in the first term. Uh, and that brighter days are ahead, particularly on the economy. That is the message they have to uh, they have to convey. If you think about it as a strategic imperative, what Republicans have to do with this convention is to shift this from being a referendum election, primarily on President Trump's response to the coronavirus, into a choice election, primarily on the economy. Mm -hmm. If they can do that after four days, uh, or begin to do that after four days, uh, that's going to be a success. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Matt, when you, when you look at the uh, you know races here in Texas, uh, what, how do you, how do you think things are shaping up uh, here here in the state of Texas? Well, um, certainly a lot of action uh, in Texas. Um, I don't see a lot of action at the statewide level. I don't think President Trump is at risk of losing Texas. Yeah. It, the margin matters. Um, the Senate race, I think Cornyn is up, uh, and I think he's up by more than, than Trump uh, is up in Texas. And I think Cornyn will win by a good margin. MJ Hager is just not really putting much together right now. Is it weird that we're just not hearing anything about this race? I have no idea what she's been doing for the last month. I really don't. It's absolutely puzzling. I've seen a couple just over-the-top comments. Other than that, I don't know what she's doing. She's probably trying to raise money outside the state, would be my guess. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, she's not getting any traction, not making corner play defense, you know, not uh, delivering a message. I don't really understand it. Um, so, but if you look down ballot, look, we're going to have at least eight competitive congressional races, six Republican incumbent seats, two Democratic incumbent seats. You know, they're all going to be 52% or less for the winner. And Trump's going to obviously affect all those races, how he does in those districts, how he does compared to 2016. Um, and then, you know, whether the Republican candidates can overperform Trump, and all of them should be able to. Uh, and that needs to be their goal, to overperform him by a few points, uh, you know, at least. Uh, so, yeah, there, I mean, there's a lot of action in Texas. That leaves out, you know, the, the targeted race for Texas Senate in Senate 19 and, and the, the 20 or 25 state house seats that are really competitive, too. So, I, you know, one thing to watch here is, you know, there's been a lot, of, lot, a, lot of, a lot said and a lot written about whether the suburbs are moving away from Trump, and that was clearly the case in 2018. They may be coming back on all this craziness that's happening in, in, in some of our cities. Yeah. Uh, and the Democrats, you know, total, uh, you know, uh, basic abdication of public safety and, and law enforcement and their you know, refusal to criticize uh, these rioters. That really does scare people in the suburbs. You, if, you, you know, if you live in a suburb, you do it for a couple of reasons. One, it's safe. Two, the schools are better. Um, and three, you can have a better standard of living. And if those things are all threatened by what we're seeing in, our, in some of these urban areas, Seattle, Portland, Chicago, New York, um, now I guess Kenosha, Wisconsin, with some of these race riots over the last couple of days, um, you know, that's a scary thing for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, I, I think you look at Kenosha and, and that, you know, that may be one of those where it really reverberates throughout America because it's not it's not Chicago. It's not a Portland. It's not a Seattle. You know, these cities that you yeah. go, OK, well, we're used to hearing about those cities. You know, we're we're used to hearing about those places that, you know, Democrat strongholds. Yeah. You know, if, if you can make it to where, you know, some of these smaller cities are being impacted. Sure. And and I think we're probably going to hear more about that during the, the the rest of the convention that you know this is this is what be, could be coming to a a neighborhood near you uh in the future. Absolutely. Um and you're right. I mean Kenosha's at at a to- totally different, you know, level. Uh, Kenosha sounds like almost any city, uh right? I mean most yeah. people probably don't know anything about it. Uh they think it sounds, you know, safe and and you know, a good place to live, good place to raise a family and a problem sure it is. I'm sure it was until a couple of days ago. Yeah, this unfortunate incident with the police and African American. Um, look, there are two things I think to watch for this week that are going to be different from last week. One is this focus on law enforcement and public safety in our cities, and that is a huge contrast. But the second issue is China. I mean, I think I think I saw, and I did not watch every minute of the Democratic National Convention because I have a low pain threshold. But I watched enough of it, and I saw somewhere that that the word China was not used until 10:57 p.m. Eastern on the on the last night, and that was when Biden mentioned it in one sentence. You're going to see uh, the Republicans, I think, mention China quite a bit, and it's not just because Trump wants to try to blame the virus on China, which I think is 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 reasonable to blame it for coming here. But it's because he thinks it is, you know, the single most important battle for the future of the country. That China is challenging us economically, diplomatically, militarily, in every way. And if we don't confront that, uh, we will not bring our manufacturing sector back the way we need to. We will not protect our economy. We will not protect our diplomatic interests. Um, and we could, in fact, be overtaken militarily uh, in the next 50 or 100 years, potentially. So um, but watch for those two issues. They're going to come up over the next three nights. Yeah. Matt, uh, tell folks about your newsletter, how they can sign up for that, and also your podcast. Yeah, the newsletter is called Must Read Texas. We take all the news from around the state, read it very early in the morning, summarize it, and put it into a short, uh, easy-to-read email delivered to inboxes by 9 a.m. You can sign up at mustread.substack.com, and you can subscribe, uh, become a paid subscriber to receive it by email each weekday morning for $3.50. The podcast is called Mac on Politics. It's in the iTunes store, on Google Play, on Stitcher, and on Spotify. Most recent episode is with Texas native Washington Post columnist Karen Tumulty, and we look back at the Democratic Convention and ahead to the rest of the 2020 election. So check that out. Very nice, uh, Matt. Uh, thanks for visiting with us today. We'll talk to you next time. Take care. That's Matt McCoviak here on the Chad Hasty Show.